sex then versus sex now. We are going to talk about what that looks like. Uh, not too personal, but <laughs> overall what that looks like after uh, we read this review. This is over on iTunes. If you guys take just a 30 seconds to go over and leave your review, it helps other people find our podcast. So this is from someone, a much needed tool. This podcast is truly saving me right now. It's coming to light that I'm pretty positive. My husband has a compulsion to viewing porn. Uh, he is still in denial despite much evidence. A friend recommended this podcast and before now I had never even heard of betrayal trauma. The show genuinely helps with the crazy making feeling I am experiencing. It helps me sort through my feelings and confusion. We've just started therapy and I know that will take time. So this show is keeping me grounded and working on boundaries in the meantime. Thank you so, so much for the honesty and insight and practical tools for dealing with these issues. Awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that and for doing the work and not just listening. Yeah. That's great. That. It's way easier to just listen. Yeah. It's harder to, uh, to do the work. Okay. Sex then versus sex now. Okay. Let's what talk about that? sex. What, is that? what does that, what does that mean? And what does it look like? Uh, can I just first say like, this is probably on everyone's mind going right after betrayal. And yet it's what we don't want to talk about because it's this thing that's probably, and for most of us, it's hurt our relationship. It's been a pain point. And mm -hmm. so this is something we did different with um, our beyond betrayal program is we brought it up in the very beginnings of the recovery process because mm -hmm. it's there yes. and you have to deal with it. And it's either we're not dealing with it or we are. So right. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about all this, Brandon. Yeah. Um, so there's a, where to start because there's a couple of, of things that need to be said, I think. And one being then versus now, it, it kind of has a connotation that um, recovery happens and then voila, you know, <laughs> like now you have good sex um, where when you're having sex during the addiction, it's horrible. And um, I, I think we need to be careful with that in that to, to understand that one, recovery is a progression. Um, it's an ongoing progression. So, but as your recovery progresses, your, your ability to connect to others, both sexually and non-sexually, um, progresses and gets better and better. And so as you get more and more into recovery, your ability to be vulnerable and intimate and um, just honest is there, which what do you know makes sex amazing in a relationship. But before we get there, let's back up and talk about what are common things that happen in a couple's sex life when the addiction is running wild and the betrayal trauma is happening right then. So there's a few things that happen. Um, and, and I'm sure you guys can speak to this and, and maybe share some of your own experience with it. Uh, one is when you don't feel safe and you feel a lot of fear, it's common for sex to um, be used to try to feel safe. So you'll have more sex, um, but that sex is done from a place of fear, not from a place of love and connection. And as you, as you have sex from this place of fear, you're actually using sex to try to get your partner to love you, to be connected to you. You start to, to feel used. You start to feel like I'm using my body, I'm using myself to try to feel loved rather than be loved. Um, it's very, very common. Yeah. Um, so, I'm going to so just say thing. the narrative for me with that was um, if I don't have sex when he's desiring it, he will go elsewhere. And so it was totally yes. fear. Like I will do this thing that I don't want to do. I don't feel safe. I'm totally betraying myself and, you know, not fully there for Kobe, but I didn't want him to go somewhere else. Yes. And so that, I think no matter what the betrayal was, your head can go to that. Yes. That and very, very common. I'm using sex to try to control the acting out and control the acting out not to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give sex so the acting out does not, not happen. 
Okay, um, so that's that, the frame that, of mind. Go ahead. Hang on, let me that. say this code yeah, real yeah. fast. That that starts to fracture the foundation like deeply fracture the foundation of a, a healthy relationship. Go ahead, Kobe. Yeah, I, I agree with that a thousand percent in, in the sense that I, I just, I, I can think back to the, the fractures where they started like that. And then I can just, I can just see the, the fracture growing over time. Yeah. And it's really interesting because that was the train of thought that Ashlyn had, right? It's like, if I don't, if I don't give this to him, then he's going to go get it somewhere else. And what's interesting about that is there was never any conversation that Ashlyn and I had where it was like, okay, Ashlyn, um, it's been 20 minutes. And if we don't have sex now, <laughs> I'm going to go. You know, there was never anything like that. Right. And, um, and, and there was never any spoken agreements so, so you never said that to her, never. Because so, sometimes, um, someone struggling with an addiction will do that. Mm. They'll say like, "You haven't, we haven't had sex enough." You know, like I'm gonna kind of threaten something here if if you don't, right? Yeah. And, I will relapse if we don't go. Yeah, or or it's just like not said, but it's kind of communicated. You're like, well, if you don't give me sex, you know, like yeah. Well, um, I do remember in the beginnings. Um, you having to undo that the belief of if I don't have sex, I will die. And mm -hmm. yeah, it was deep inside. True. Um that was totally true. But I didn't realize that was the case for years and years until we really started recovery where I was like, sure. wait, wait, what? But it was, but I but I really acted like that and I carried the energy. Did you feel that. my energy of not really being there? One thousand percent. Yeah. One thousand percent. And that was the that was the piece that I think is important to note is is again. Ashton had these notions. I never said those things. I also didn't tell her contrary to that either. Hey, listen, if we don't have sex because you're not feeling safe, it's okay. Yeah. I never said that. Yeah. Like right. I was never interested well, and in Ashlyn's safety. That wasn't necessarily my radar either, which is kind well, of well, it's not weird though when you think about it. That the nature of pornography is about consumption. And so so uh, somebody who who's addicted to pornography they go, their sexual experiences, a lot of them is going to something, getting it, using it for their own gratification and, and getting pleased and then they're gratified. Right. And, and uh, someone with struggling with a sex addiction starts to look at their spouse similarly. And this is where that entitlement comes in, where sex is my thing and I need you to be gratified and satisfied. So where is it? Like, bring it like, come on. Um, you, you, I'm kind of entitled to this. I need you. I need it. And, and that is not healthy intimacy. That's not healthy sexuality in a, in a relationship. Um, it's not his to own or his to expect or his to have and hers to have to give in order to please him. That's not what healthy sex is all about. Yeah. Um, um, I will say there's, <laughs> we lived in that world for so many years. And part of it is, you know, we would try to have conversations about our sex life, you know, not me bringing it up for sure, but Kobe. And because it was Kobe who was like, Hey, he could see that there was nothing like no connection. He wanted connection. You know, we went to therapy for years. That's all he said. I just want connection. And I didn't understand what that meant. Neither did you really. I had no idea. No idea. Yeah. But I think, the fact that we couldn't even bring ourselves to talk about it. I was too hurt that he was bringing up this thing that was hurting us. Right. And so I couldn't even listen because in my head, all that was replaying was like, but look at all those other things that you're doing. How are you unhappy? And why are you wanting more? It's never enough kind of feeling. Um, so I do own that my part of being totally stuck in my own stuckness and, and being, you know, I didn't know better. I, when I learned that, Hey, I could get help that the reasons that I felt the way I felt were, there's like a name for it. There's actually, you know, specialized therapists like yourself, Brandon, who could help me work through those things. Right. Then it was like, okay, I don't want to live like this anymore because I didn't enjoy it. And he didn't enjoy it. Right. Right. It was, it was, I think that those early days, I think were the 
um, it was when we had sex in those early days, it was, that's when the seeds of dutiful sex were sown. Totally. And I've used that term, you know, duty, Ash on your hair, just because of duty. I use that so many times and threw that back in your face because it, because it, 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 uh, because there wasn't connection. And I certainly, I certainly didn't know anything about, I, I didn't, I didn't know and understand who I was sexually. Uh, and I'm not even talking about um, my sexual preference, which is, which is heterosexual, but I didn't understand me. I, I really altogether just rejected myself sexually, unless it was in the context of having sex with Ashlyn or when I was all wrapped up around the axle with addiction and I was acting out. And that right. was just another activity to further reject myself. Right. And, you if, know, in and of itself as an if activity. Real, if real healthy, good sex is about um, kind of a culmination of all of the other things that, that, that build up in a relationship, trust, safety, good communication, um, intimacy, all, all these things that build up. And then what do you know? You can make love and it's amazing. Um, you know, it's a little bit crazy to think that if you're spinning in an addiction and you also have some betrayal trauma going on, that your sex life is going to be awesome. Now, sometimes the physical part of it still is. The physical part of it is still good, but the intimacy part is, is missing. And sex is interesting because sex is more of an outcome of an amazing relationship. When it's that, then it's good. When sex is a Band-Aid, when sex is a tool, when sex is being used, sex actually becomes destructive and, and hard. And you, you talk about a painful Ashlyn, it's a pain point in the relationship because it, it's, it's throwing vulnerability out there when safety isn't there. And so it's just crushing over and over again. Um, I want to bring up a couple of other things, uh, the then, so like okay. sex, sex when it's unhealthy, common things with sex addiction. Um, and I, I'm thinking of two of them right now. One is it is not uncommon for the person struggling with addiction to never initiate sex or want sex with their spouse. Um, I know that sounds backwards, but someone with an addiction is struggling with their shame. They don't feel lovable as they are. What they don't want to experience is rejection. So oh, why, a fragile state of mind. Yeah. It's like really the, the chemistry that what you said is really, really striking, Brandon, because it's, I mean, we are normal humans in the sense of having a biological and chemical dr like draw to being sexual. Because that's in us. Of it's course. It's just yes. I'm a human. But then to, to have that experience a head on collision <laughs> with my own sexual identity that's so attached to pain, mm -hmm. discomfort, and disconnection, it's a recipe for disaster. Yep. Like, yep. I it, totally get what you're saying. It just feeds the shame, like the shame over and over. And then, and then it's to be actually vulnerable in a relationship. When the pornography comes in, it's like, well, like, why do I, why do I, why should I go risk rejection? Why should I go do the work of the, the hard work of a relationship when I can go get my needs met so easily over here? Um, and so I'm not going to be vulnerable in my relationship. I'm not going to put myself out there. I'm not going to put my shame on the line. And, and that's where sexual anorexia and things like that start to come into play. And, uh, you know, not everybody who doesn't initiate sex has sexual anorexia. However, that's why sexual anorexia and sex addiction actually work well together because I don't have to be vulnerable with a human being yet. I can still go get my sexual needs met. I'm doing that in quotations um, another way. So that's a common one. Another common one is, is caused because of tolerance. And so what, what I mean by that is, um, someone struggling with a sex addiction, they may, if they've been struggling for a long time, um, they've, you know, looked at certain types of pornography for a while. Now that's not doing it for them. So now they're pushing another limit. They're being exposed to more stuff. 
And sometimes they bring that into the bedroom and they start to push limits and, and, and coerce and, and force or try to get their partner to do things that are uncomfortable to them. Um, but, but they're pushing those limits because they just, they, they want the dopamine hit. They're in the middle of a sexual experience and they're, they're pushing a limit because their, their tolerance is built up. And that can be uh, obviously, obviously that's can be very destructive to the relationship. How common is that Brennan for you to, for you to experience a couple who goes through that kind of season? Uh, more common than um, it's very common, okay. unfortunately. Okay. And, um, and, and what's interesting is like, when I hear about it, it's oftentimes like done very, I don't know how to put this, but very much like an addict would do it. Um, subtly, subtly, very manipulatively. Kind of testing the waters, you know, gaslighting their way into some of the stuff and, and making their spouse feel like a prude or like, mm -hmm. you know, that, and so, and so then it's just like, just slowly deteriorating any trust and safety there, which now that now the partner's feeling more and more forced to do certain things and, and, and or does certain things they don't want to do and then feels really yucky and really used. And then you can see how the relationship just really is not doing well at that point. Oh my gosh, Ashlyn, he's totally describing us. I, I totally remember being in those in, in just, I don't know how many scenarios where it was, where it was, um, I was so afraid to address it, but I was yet at the same time, so um, spun out and hijacked in my own sexual entitlement mm -hmm. and drive an addiction that it was, it was just like, how am I going to say this? How am I going to say this? How do I want to? And it's just like, blah, I would just like spit something random out at Ashlyn and, and, um, and out of nowhere and with no context and with no consideration of where she was just like, just throw some, you know, wild idea out or some random thought. And, um, and I knew very quickly that what was and wasn't okay with Ashlyn because Ashlyn Wears all of her emo her emotions on her sleeve. That's true. And <laughs> right, and you can just tell. Um, and so there began to be this really. I mean, sex be like it was like <laughs> we had so many walls up yes. around sex, both of us. Yeah. And truly, you, I think Kobe, you thought it was just me who had all these walls. You know, we built what 14 years of our marriage just wall after wall like well if you're we, gonna have a wall here well i'm gonna put one here and 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 we didn't even realize it until we started to break it down yeah and it was like oh my gosh yeah. which which here's the tricky part is when you have all these walls up around sex um as a couple you can still have sex yeah um but what you can't have is intimacy yeah and so it's like okay we're getting the job done we're doing this thing that totally. married couples do but but now like, it's just, it's like, it's just painful. It's just, okay. hurts. and I remember Brandon, you saying at some point, um, like, you'll know when it's like the deep, meaningful sexual intimacy, yeah. it doesn't feel the same. It's not the, 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 that it will change. And I remember being like, okay. And then when we had that, it was like, oh, you really don't know until you experience it's it. It's an entirely different experience. It's yeah. not just a physical, let's get this done with. I'm entitled to it. We, you know, I, I'm forced into it. It's none of that. It's none of that. It's like, it's hard to describe, but it's just uh -huh. intimate connection. It's intimate connection where you, you, you make love mm -hmm. and, but, but you're not going to make love unless there's real recovery there on both sides. Um, and so when both partners are working their recovery, ultimately, when we talk about recovery, you, you gain back a sense of who you are. So then you can be a vulnerable person and create connection and attachment that's really good. And what do you know? Love making is possible once you're showing up that way. And, and, you know, it's not every time you have sex, you're having this deep spiritual experience, but every time you're having sex, you're feeling connected and you're feeling close and you're feeling trust and you're feeling gratitude for each other. 
um, yeah, that's recovery sex. And that's, that's the good stuff. <laughs> that's like the stuff that it, it, it's like circling back to what you said earlier, which is recovery is this progressive journey, this progressive road. And so is sex. It, it, it really, and, and the interesting thing is, is that the more I began to understand and accept myself, the, the, the greater quality and connection in my own life um, I had like the, like the, my, my quality of experience began to grow as I began to understand who I was. And I'm not even talking like sex. I'm just talking like me as an individual. Yeah. And, and that was the bedrock for me learning to accept my, accept myself, um, sexually. And, and, yes. to, and, and what I mean by that is, is I, I denied I didn't, I, I would deny myself um, like a sexual existence because it had been so painful and it had brought so much shame on me and on Ashlyn and on us as a couple. And, and I really did deny the fact that I was a sexual being. It was like, I have to like, I just, I just didn't allow myself any grace to accept that and right. to be okay. For instance, feeling horny to, right. to I, I, I was like, bad there's this really there's this really vulnerable space so like where i was talking about tolerance and pushing limits and gaslighting and things like that um but i really like what you're saying kobe where there's this really vulnerable space with a couple where both partners can come to the table and say this is who i am emotionally this is who i am sexually um and maybe who you are sexually is a little out there it's like what like you Meaning know a little out there not not crazy, not twisted, not perverted, but just you have a different uh, template it, but it of might sexuality. Feel twisted or even a little perverted to your partner. But here's, here's what I or want. Or even to yourself. Yeah, or even to yourself. And in a really, really healthy relationship, I could go to my partner and say, I desire this. This is on my arousal template. This is who I am. And they might say, I desire that too. Let's go explore some stuff. Or they might say, "Ugh, like I do not desire that at all." But in that space, you'd feel them loving you still. They're able to say no, like that won't work for me. I can't do that with you. But I see you. I understand you. You're okay as you are, right? So, so you're not pushing and forcing me to do anything. I'm boundaryed over here, and you're actually not gaslighting me or manipulating. You're actually being vulnerable about who you are sexually. And we're going to communicate here. Like, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that doesn't work for me. But this other thing that you like does, like, I really enjoy that. So like, let's, let's do some more of that because I can't do that with you. Right. Yep. Um, that what you just explained, Brandon, is a really great illustration of where I end and when my partner begins. Yes. Two yes. autonomous people in a partnership where they have their own identities and it's okay that they are separate. It's okay that they are different. And it's okay that they're um, acknowledging the differences between them, but also saying we can still coexist and function and love and respect where the other is without an agenda, without um, trying to, you know, bend someone's will, et cetera. Without consuming um, each other or coercing yeah, each other. Yeah. 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 That's, that, that's, that's a, that's a really, really important part. And the truth is, is that I want to be really clear on this. Um, just because we started recovery doesn't mean that, <laughs> that sex all of a sudden became very, very different. It, 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 it changed. Yes. But it took years in recovery for me to, to get to the place where it's like, I feel comfortable in who I am. And, and Ashlyn, this is actually who I am. So I, I would say, if we're kind of transitioning from then to now, we got to skip. We can't skip the middle. We can't. Skip, which is what <laughs> the messy middle. Yeah, I think okay, it so got I'll pause messy. Mine and, yeah, and you share because more about I that. think yes, before maybe your discovery, or maybe you know, you know, I knew for all those fourteen years what was going on, most of it, and so it was just a, a disconnect right there. But as we stepped into recovery and we're getting specialized therapy and group and and really trying to work on our own paths of healing. Uh, yeah, we did. We had a sex fast, which we have a whole podcast on. That was awesome. Um, we took a break where we said we have to redefine what sex is. 
and um, we changed even uh, verbiage. Um, and if you've read the book, Come As You Are, she talks about both those things for a healthy relationship, not betrayal or addiction, but just a healthy relationship. You might need a sex fast. You also might need to change your verbiage. So there's some verbiage, especially after uh, betrayal and addiction, that's really a turnoff. And so if you guys haven't had those agreements and, you know, had these discussions, the book come as you are. I mean, we had printouts that we just filled in. Like, these are words I don't like. These are words I do like. And that helps us be safe for each other, but also show up of like, I want to turn on your, your gas, not your brakes. I want yes. you to be able to be fully here without going, Oh, 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 I'm uncomfortable. Okay. So just to be clear on that, what Ashlyn just said, I think this is, this is a key piece because the old me would not have got this. Okay. The old me would need this explanation. Okay. okay. Recovery or sex and recovery does not mean that I now get Ashlyn to, to do and experience all the things that I ever thought about in porn. Okay. <laughs> Red fantasies, fantasies. Right. Does does right. that make sense? Like that's not what that is. It's, it's legitimately, it's legitimately being able to say, um, we are different people and we need to remove any preconceived notions on what we wanted previously, what we expected previously, et cetera. Because I mean, really the, the sex fast for us, Brandon was like, was allowing our old life, our old sex life to die so that a new one could be reborn. Yes. And uh. it was um, a critical piece in being able to, to jumpstart, if you will. It's Kobe. New, it's like, it's like this as you're talking it's like, it's hard to describe to someone who hasn't experienced it. Yeah. So like a healthy, a really healthy sex life is when a couple is exploring and creating together. And so it's not c consuming each other, using each other. It's, it's just that you're getting to know yourself as well as getting to know your partner because there's so much safety and security and love there that there's just opportunity for vulnerability and, and growth together. And, and that's like, that's what, what healthy intimacy is all about. Um, and it, it, which is so opposite from fear-based sex where yeah. sex has been used and abused in so many ways in the relationship. Um, and so, yeah, but, but when you start to, and, and, and I really like Ashton, what you were saying about the messy middle, because um, that's where the, the work is. And, um, you know, it's, it's about going from where you're at right now. If, if a lot of the things we've talked about today have triggered you of like, oh my gosh, that's where we're at. Uh, yeah, we've been stuck there for a long time. Um, then, you know, and I'm talking about this uh, creation, awesome, intimate experience thing. Right. Well, stop for a minute and step into the messy middle where you just, do th small things like change the verbiage, read the book, come as you are, um, take beyond betrayal where we talk about it. Listen to Finlayson Fife, who's one of our favorite sex therapists, or like, like do certain things to start to educate yourself, to grow, to step into things. And Oh, by the way, have some good, healthy boundaries <laughs> around it. Yes. Yes. Well. yes. I, I think that the thought as you, as you were sharing, Brandon was, um, and this is like a, an asterisk, like FYI, here's some fine print. Okay, just to keep, just to keep in mind, and that is, when I was acting out in addiction, even before I was I was married to Ashlyn, like sex, porn, and masturbation was was about um, was was a coping mechanism. It was a it was something that I used to cope and deal with, but like as far as stress is concerned in life. Okay, I couldn't handle anything, so I needed to um, look at porn and masturbate and get off so that I could get back to business, okay? So when, I, so when I have a context of like, sex is about me getting off and it's about me relieving stress and handling life, then I plug that into, 
wait, Ashlyn, don't you know sex is about me getting off so I can handle stress in life? Like that's <laughs> a, a, a huge turn I was on. never saying that. Oh, I, I bet she's all over you. I know, right? Super she's like, turned yeah, on. When, you gotcha. come up, when you come across that way. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. When you lay it out like that, Kobe, so <laughs> oh, eloquently, man. it's like, oh, baby, I got the rose petals <laughs> ready to go. Candles are on. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's nothing like that. But, but, but if we just look at it, just simply put, that's what my... That's that's the purpose for which I used sex. That's your context. Well, and that is my and context. What you described was very selfish behavior, right? And it felt very selfish in right. And part of that was some of my own walls that after you know certain things happen, I just create a wall to protect myself. And yes. for me to take down those walls, you know, I, I do admit and have before on podcasts, I waited too long to work on my own sexual healing. Um, I did do Finlayson Fife's course, uh, both her courses, because I had to unwire some of those shame narratives and some of the mm -hmm. things that I just thought were hard no's when in truth were just me scared. Yes. And, and not open enough to even ask myself what I, what I wanted. Well, and that's kind of the, the whole paradox to sex, which is yeah. se healthy sexuality is very much an individual thing. Um, but we, we know that it's not an individual thing. So, but it's very much an individual thing. And so yes. th that's the, that's the paradox is, is to explore who we are, to accept who we are, to have compassion for ourselves. And then what do you know? Um, accept that and then, and then connect with another person in that. And, yes. Totally. So, and, and so I guess that's why I'm, I'm, I, I, I shared that to begin with is like, wait, Ashton, don't you know that sex is only about me getting off? I, I really had no thought process um, about the, the true experience that sex could be between two people. Yes. I, I just had, I had no idea what that looked like. And, and, and that was part of the pain that we experienced was the fact that I was using my own sexuality just to, just to cope and deal with. I didn't use it to connect yes. with another person. And I didn't know how to connect with another person um, sexually because I couldn't even connect to myself yeah. sexually. So that's why recovery has been so beautiful um, as, as far as um, sex in recovery, because sex now, because it it's not about me taking care of my stress it's about me deepening the connection with ashlyn yes yeah it's and not a selfish it, act it's, as it once was no and and it's anyways okay. i don't want to i don't want to beat that dead horse but i really think it's important that everybody hears that that the addict hears that but also the betrayed hears that yeah. that if you're struggling in part it's because your partner has been using it to cope and hasn't figured out how to connect so yes, with it. I have a question. I hear this frequently and I know Kobe does as well. Maybe you do too, Brennan. Okay. Um, from the, you know, the person who has betrayed saying, if we could just have better sex, then like life would be better. Uh -huh. So like, when are they going to get better? Because once, you know, my partner, the once betrayed can just figure out their sexual health, this will all be gone. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that, um, that's, a, that's kind of a complicated question because there, there is some truth to that. So, so what I mean by that is, but a part of betrayal trauma is sexual trauma is, you know, when you've been betrayed, you don't want to go be vulnerable with somebody and especially sexually. Um, and so part of the betrayed's work, and, and this is really unfair to them, but part of their work is to do that trauma work around sexuality and then to practice vulnerability again with their partner. That, that's, that's part of it, right? Um, but if they have a partner who, who are going to them and saying, once you fix your sexuality, then we'll be ha happy again, then they're probably picking up on emotions and things saying, he's not really safe. And those things might be spot on, right? And so there's this space where he's very patient, loving, kind, supportive of her working through that process of healing um, and not trying to force it so that he can get sex. Um, and that's where the healing 
really takes place is he holds space for her pain. She feels connected because he's holding space for her pain. She feels safer. She does her own work, her own trauma work, and then healthy sex starts to happen. It's not just, hey, let's have sex. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. That was good sex. We're healed. We're cured. Yeah. Voila. And that's, I think, where where it goes to for in my head is when I hear that question, it's like, that's not the end goal. The end goal is not great sex. The end goal is connection and it's this in, deep intimacy. But well, Ashlyn, so- there, there's, oh. this, there's this short-term feeling of okayness that sex creates. So it's, mm-hmm. it's oh, we just had amazing sex. The world is right. Everything's <laughs> good. Oh, this is awesome. Why can't we just have amazing sex every day and then everything's good? Well, the problem is, is that amazing sex, if that's built on a foundation that is corroding, then it's not, it's not going to continue and it's not going to last. And so, although it feels good in that moment, it feels like the world's right in that moment. It does not mean that your relationship is okay. Yeah. Yeah. That that's, that's really, really, I mean, I think that's a key, I think that's a key statement because we've talked a lot about, right. That recovery can be like a, a profit and loss, you know, spreadsheet like statement. And we can, you know, be deep, deep, deep in the red. And we have some, we have some great connecting sex. And then all of a sudden we are operating from a place of, okay, it, it sucks super bad, but now it just sucks a little bit less. But we think because there's some connection through there, through, through sex and that, and that we have kind of climbed out of a really deep, deep pit of suck, but we're still in the red, like deep in the red, deep in the suck that we're like good. And I think that's important to remember is that you can't, you can't sex your way into the black. <laughs> yes. You sex my way through that. No, you can't. You can't. You can't. Sex isn't the way that isn't the vehicle to get into the no. black from a PL standpoint. And, and it's the same thing with recovery. It, w- that can be one layer of intimacy that you, for which you can grow and you can develop both of you individually, but it still demands connection in so many other ways. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, Brandon, you said, um, it's not fair that the betrayed has to often go and do trauma work. Um, going back to our episode on EMDR and ART, um, although not fair, I also do see as such a benefit because how many, I mean, the statistics on women being sexually assaulted or abused are just ridiculously Mm -hmm. off the charts. And Mm -hmm. so what I find is when these women that I get to help say, you know what, I'm going to go and do my trauma work. They're usually not even doing trauma work on their marriage. It's stuff that happened before, which was the case for me. And so, yes, there's, there's damage here, but I also had some of my own hurts that I brought in that maybe I wouldn't have ever chosen to work on otherwise. And so, um, I, and, and, and I'd like to even broaden that out and say uh, individuals working on healthy sexuality is going to bless their lives and couples working on a healthy sex life. It'll bring up stuff in your relationship, um, bring up maybe unhealthy communication patterns or past trauma that you've had or whatever. But, but if, if you're working toward real intimacy, then one, it's worth the work and two, it's opportunities for growth. So so, and that, that goes for betrayal, trauma, and sex addiction. Yeah. Um, so I, I love that you say that Ashlyn, because you can say that because you've been through it. Some, <laughs> some people who have been betrayed have a hard time, um, accepting that as, as a reality, but you do see the blessing that it's been yeah. in your life. In, in so. the moment it's hard and it's not fair, but like Matthew McConaughey says, nothing's fair. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just want to share one quick thing and then I'm done. Um, I got a message from someone who I was able to help uh, mentor. She reached out to me on New Year's Day, two years ago. Okay. Just like okay. the world is, I've run away from my family. I'm done. I'm so over this. Like she was at her rock bottom. Okay. She started into group. She got into therapy. She started doing her work. And so she sent me this message of like, I can't believe that that was two years ago. It feels like it was five because it, it was so long ago, um, but it wasn't. And here she is. She said this New Year's Day from that one where I felt like divorce, like everything was off, you know, nothing was going well. 
to doing that work. And she said, we woke up and we were sexually intimate on New Year's Day this year in 2021. And she's like, it blew my mind. Like I never thought that we could be there and to have mm -hmm. that safety and that desire. And so I, I, we can't share those types of stories here for everyone, but I, I promise it. you there are so many more like that. So if you feel like you're in that place of just like hopelessness, or maybe you're on Kobe's side or you're on my side of like, this is never going to get better. And this is not going great. It can, if you put the work into it. Yes. Find yes, the right yes, tools. yes, it totally can. And I, and I'll, and I'll say that one of the reasons why we're talking about reading come as you are and, and, um, and also other courses as well on sexuality is because that gave us context to discuss intellectually. Okay. And when we, when we began to share intellectually where we were on the topic of sex, okay. Then it was like, we had, we had, um, a platform where we could discuss it safely. And that meant that we could, that and that platform, that meant that we could both show up in a vulnerable way and saying, okay, actually with this topic right here in this book, I didn't, I didn't understand that at all. Right. And, right. Um, and, and, and I want to say for me personally, as much as I rubbed in Ashlyn's face, oh, you're a prude and I'm, you know, I'm not that, I'm not that guy. You only kiss three. You know, it's like, as soon as, as soon as I let go of that, then I re, then I was able to actually say, okay, look, I might put on the show, but the truth is all this stuff right here that we just read, I don't know anything about yeah. in the book. Yeah. I was, I was a classic poser in that I was posing. Like I was like the guy who understood it. And in truth, I was very ignorant, right. very ignorant. And it took vulnerability to admit that from me. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't had that intellectual experience on talking about sex then we wouldn't be where we are today. And we're still progressing on this great journey. And I love the fact that we can, I can go to Ashlyn and say, Ashlyn, guess what? I want to try this. Or I was thinking about this and it's totally okay. And if you, those of you who are, who are listening and not watching, when I, ju I just, when I said that, I looked over, I glanced over at Ashlyn and I, and I saw the warmest, safest, intimate smile with her and and what that look said to me ashlyn was i'm your person and i got you all right ashlyn and kobe are going to go have sex now so i think i need to bow <laughs> out of this <laughs> we need to end this <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> that no. that might be but but <laughs> it's it's honestly it's it is the safest thing it, it was so scary for, for, and it wasn't just scary like one time just to ask a question or just to no. make a statement. It was scary for a season, but, but we were more than anything, we were honestly, Brandon, just like super committed to saying, let's just talk regularly right. about the thing right. that we have never talked Outside about. Outside of the bedroom. Yes. There's lots of things uh. that go into that. I think we have a whole episode on like, why is it so hard to talk about sex? You know, we can get naked with each other, but we can't actually talk about what we do when we're naked. Yeah. Um, so well, yeah. And, and a quick little, a quick little uh, promotion here. Our 30 day challenge has all kinds of little things that you can do yeah. Yeah. that, that kind of, and, and it's not about hopping in the bed naked together. It's about other little things you can do to connect, to, to feel supported, to feel secure yeah. with each other. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I forget. We spent a whole week on the layers of intimacy. So that's what you're saying. It's, yes. it's not a recovery program, 30 days, I wish, but, um, it's building that bedrock, like you said, yes. so that the sex is the cherry on top and not yep. the foundation. Yep. And, and I will say this too, what's cool about sex now is because we can, because we can be so open and so transparent. Um, it's, this is really interesting. Sex used to be this, um, this thing that I would obsess about. Okay. I would, I would obsess about it. Um, and meaning it, I would, I would, I would probably actually bounce between like preoccupation to obsession, mm -hmm. depending on the day, depending on how stressed I was. And now I don't spend any time in those places because if I, if I feel the pull of sexuality at all, I share it with Ashlyn. 
And so that eliminates the preoccupation. It eliminates. That doesn't mean that we can't um, engage in foreplay and conversation, but it, it means that I don't have to obsess. I don't have to be emotionally and mentally exhausted feeling sexual and trying not to be because yeah. I thought it was quote unquote yeah. bad. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it is, it's like this beautiful, it's this beautiful balance of ebb and flow. Like when you really see, like for instance, on a river runs through it, right? When you, when you see them fishing and you see the flow of the river, it's just this tranquil, beautiful thing that's powerful, but that's gentle, that's beautiful and that's tranquil. And, um, <laughs> that's really, I mean, I'm, I'm always, right? Ashland's Ashland's like, whoa, <laughs> like, whoa, where are we going here? Now we're in a river in Montana. This right. <laughs> Ashland yeah. should be okay with it because Brad Pitt's there. It's like, come on, <laughs> Ashland. It's okay. <laughs> Somebody was saying, I love when Kobe brings in his movies because yeah. it helps yeah. me understand. So, yeah. but, you're welcome. but it is the beauty of contrast. <laughs> it's the beauty that exists in the yin, the, the yin and, and, and the yang. And yeah. that's the beautiful part about this is, is that now Ashlyn and I can see the landscape. We can see the, right. the, the, the rocks and that we can see the powerful flow of the river and be totally okay with it. Right. Because we can talk about it because we can have trust and safety with it. That is a beautiful thing. So more than anything from this conversation, I hope sex then versus sex now is the, I hope that you, I hope you take away that it is possible to have, sexual conversation, sexual acceptance of self, sexual safety, and and have a very healthy sexual identity with sex with your partner. And it takes work and it takes commitment to be okay being uncomfortable, but it is so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Yep. All right. I I if you're listening to this episode and you related to it, you found it helpful. I dare you to share it with somebody. I dare you. I know the betrayed, the addicted, the expert, that name is a hard name to share. It's a hard topic. So I dare you. Do something courageous. Somebody you know might be struggling with, with the things we've, we've talked about. Share this with them. It'd be awesome. Sex then, sex now. Guys, thanks for being a part of this. Thanks for being here and listening. Give us a review and rate us over on the uh, podcast app and uh, it might be your review that we read on our next episode. So thanks guys for appreciating awesome. being here. Thanks. See you guys.